So welcome today to Construction Podcast, and we have an amazing guest with us today. We have Ryan Bader, mixed martial artist with Bellator. So welcome, Ryan. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to have you on. You know, this is one I've really been looking forward to, Ryan. I met you through uh, Kill Cliff, actually yeah. a function that we'll get into later. Um, but your story is amazing, and it's just it's fascinating. To, you know, what's interesting, when people look through social media and they look at either it's business or athletes, you know, they have this persona where they think, hey, Ryan's just this unique athlete. Like, you know, here he is, to you know, super successful. He he owns the belts now, but they don't realize the journey, right? What goes into it? So, you know, they think it's an overnight success. So, for you, like, when did that journey start in athletics? Uh, probably, you know, ever since I could enter some sort of athletic event, I was, you know, whether that was, you know, soccer at five years old or whatnot. But I think it really. It started around seven or eight, you know, I was playing football and I was wrestling and the wrestling really has gotten me to where I am today. And, you know, first couple of years, obviously new sport, it's tough. Um, But around 10, 11, I really started to go kind of year round. Parents would take me to, you know, these, uh, you know, freestyle tournaments outside the regular wrestling season. And I really started to dive into the wrestling and um, we were going, I mean, there's probably two months of the year that I wasn't wrestling and we were traveling all over. And so I think that's really when my, you know, athletic, high level athletic career started, you know, and I was a good football player. I was playing football, um, but wrestling was my main deal. And, um, you know, that continued throughout, uh, you know, throughout high school go into these freestyle tournaments and all that, you know, then getting a scholarship to go to ASU to wrestle and uh, ultimately got me into MMA. Yeah, it's a long journey. I mean, people don't realize, you know, even for you, I know you were a a very uh, talented football player in the state of Nevada, you know, super successful in football. Yeah, here we're in wrestling. I mean, I, I will say it's super rare to meet someone that's super talented at wrestling at such a young age, you know, 10 or 11. You know, so how... What, what, was that just something that was natural to you that you felt, hey, I'm really good at this, you know, there, you know, I know this is something I could be successful at, or what is it that drew you into the wrestling over football? No, I mean, at the beginning, you know, in any sport, you're not going to be the best. You're not going to be really even good, you know. And so my whole motto is you just got to put in the work, you know. You get what you put in, and that's what I have a lot of MMA fighters you know, coming to me and like, Hey, I want to be in the UFC. I want to be in Bellator. I want to be in these big shows. What can I do? And there's no magic pill or anything. You have to be consistent. You have to put in the work, you know, and, and on the wrestling side, I mean, I I love playing football. Um, We had a great team, you know, we were um, undefeated pretty much throughout high school. Um, You know, I got bumped up my, my sophomore year, we lost a game, you know, the state championship, but we went on to win state my senior year. Uh, you're playing with your buddies. There's camaraderie. You know, um, we're 14 and 0, top 25 in the nation. I got Nevada Defensive Player of the Year. All this kind of stuff. And and um, I, after we won state, I was sitting there like, man, I think I want to play football. You know, <laughs> and so I was a 185 pound middle linebacker. It wasn't overly fast. You know, I was good, but I had to get the tape into the hands of the coaches. And on paper, I didn't look that great. Um, you know, so I, I was I was kind of thinking about both, and I went to one both wrestling and football, um, seeing what I could get offer wise, went to one last wrestling tournament. It was a first state. It was our first place finishers in every single state, all in one tournament. And I ended up getting third and that got pretty heavily recruited. And, um, you know, coach from ASU recruited me also. And then when I came down here, I fell in love with the place and ended up choosing to wrestle. It's interesting. I was going to ask you what made that decision because, as you mentioned, you know, the, the, the draw about football, for those that played football, you know, and basketball, like that team camaraderie is big, right? And that, yeah. you know, it, it's huge. Whereas wrestling, I mean, what's really tough about a sport such as wrestling or MMA or golf, you know, these are when – you, when you talk about hard work, there, there's also self-discipline, right? Because yeah. you're not accountable to anybody else. You're accountable to yourself. And so you're only as successful as the amount of work you put in. And, and, and so to find that for you, I mean, when you think about that level, because I'm always fascinated with speaking with athletes where, you know, for, for everyone, there, there's so many wrestlers out there, right? And for you to be one of the top wrestlers in the country in high school and in college, I mean, to be an All-American, what is that separation where you have thousands of wrestlers, but what separates those wrestlers such as you, Ryan, from everybody else? I think it's a mindset in, in being consistent, really, you know, um, 
especially in, in college, um, even as a kid, you know, I would run, I would run three miles three times a week. That was on top of going to wrestling practice, you know, and, and that was a lot of, uh, you know, my dad wasn't overly hard on me or anything like that. He just wanted me to, to succeed. So he would come and run with me and stuff. Hey, we're going to do this run. I didn't want to, you know, but I did it. <laughs> and we went yeah. to those tournaments and, and we were doing it year round and, and I was all in basically. And so, I mean, that carried over into, into, uh, in college, you know, a lot of guys would go home for the summer and not wrestle once for two, three months, you know, where, you know, I would, I would do that. I would go, you know, back to, I'm from Reno, Nevada. I'd go back for a little bit, uh, but I was still wrestling when I was here, you know, in Tempe, I was going into the wrestling room and wrestling and that carried over to MMA too. It, it's being consistent and having the mindset together with being consistent. It's going to, you're going to get better no matter what, if you're putting in the work, you're going to get better. And so ever since I started MMA, I've never stopped. You know, I have never taken more than two weeks off, you know, um, and, and that was one time because I had a, a knee surgery, you know, but I'm back in there, you know, every day, all the time, trying to get better. You know, even now, you know, X amount of years since I started this thing, a lot to learn and I'm not going to stop because I want to be and continue to be the best. I love that mentality, you know, Ryan, and it's interesting because the reason I, I, I just love athletics, all athletics, you know, I'm a pretty competitive guy, but I love watching because there's so much correlation between business and athletics. And as you mentioned, I mean, you know, it, I, I know a lot of basketball athletes and football players, and there are times where, you know, because of their talent, you know, they may take it off or, or have a break, but it's always admirable when you're looking at, you know, wrestlers or MMA or, um, even, you know, track athletes that, you know, these are people that you're not taking time off. I mean, you're, you're consistent yeah. and really that's the key to business. That's the key to life. If you're consistent and you put in the work, you know, and as you mentioned, you're seeking to get better and seeking to refine those skills, you know, so where does the nickname come from? I mean, you had this, the, the most amazing nickname, Ryan Darth Bader, which I think is phenomenal. I mean, when did that start? So it started back at ASU wrestling and there would, there would be uh, kind of like forums, you know, on the internet that, you know, guys would talk about wrestling and this was like, these were like fans and whatnot. And, um, and, um, somebody started calling me Darth on there. And there's one guy that would come into the ASU wrestling room, like just a super fan of wrestling. Right. And he would always call me Darth and, you know, that kind of stuck a little <laughs> bit. And then I went into my first MMA gym at Arizona combat sports and, um, they started calling me Darth out of nowhere. And I was like, well, I think that, you know, that's, that's your nickname. It's not given, you don't, you don't choose your nickname usually. Right. And right. At, at the end yeah. of the day, it was better than Ryan masturbator. And so we're going to go with Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Right. And Darth Vader has, uh, you know, it just with the cinema background, right. From star Wars. I mean, it just yeah. gives you this ambiance, right. As you're stepping into the ring. So when you were at ASU, I mean, we're, what, was there an introduction to the combat sports, to MMA? I mean, was it something you had watched? I mean, what, you, you know, I know that there's – that's one of your strengths is your wrestling background, and that's why you've done so well. But, you know, how did that introduction begin? So I've always watched it, right? Even, like, my dad and I would go to Blockbuster back in the day, and, and we would find these – the first time we found, like, you know, um, the UFC deal when it was, like, karate versus wrestler, kind of no time limit. And so I've knew I've known about it, and then it was getting more popular as you know when I went through college, and then I believe I believe uh, the Ultimate Fighter one, which really was a catalyst to the UFC, was uh, was on during you know my junior year in college or whatnot, and we knew my coach knew one of the guys, Josh Koscheck, that was on there, and this and that, and then um, as the seasons kind of went on, we knew a buddy, Jesse Forbes, that was. Uh, you know, that wrestled, didn't wrestle at ASU, but wrestled in Arizona. Um, he went on and he was fighting Matt Hamill. And so he asked myself and CB Dalloway, another ASU wrestler to help him prepare. And, you know, we'd be in the wrestling room and stuff and had no idea what we were doing, but we were very, very good wrestlers and we could control him and we could do this. And we started thinking like, huh, you know, maybe I can do this. And then after I got done with, with college and I was, uh, Done with wrestling, you know, I, I went down a cut weight at 197 every single year. 
And so I was smoked by the, by the time and I've wrestled my whole life. And I, I didn't want to wrestle. I was kind of burned out. And, um, I'm like, I don't want to do, I don't want to go to the gym unless I want to go to the gym. I don't want to have, you know, anybody else to tell me I've done that my whole life. And so I was like, all right, you know, what do I want to do? I was potentially going to go to law school and this and that, but I want to get some work experience. I've been an athlete my whole life. So I'm like, I'm going to put myself in a, a sales job, business to business sales job, you know, to get that out of my comfort zone. And I was doing that and realized real quick, real quick, I didn't want to do that. And I <laughs> missed competing. So after two months of not competing, not doing anything, I was like, man, I need to at least go, you know, train or do something and have that fire back. And it's not necessarily competing, it's just training. And so I, we went into that guy's gym, Jesse Forbes, who we were already messing around with. And we're like, well, we kind of, you know, want to just work out. And then obviously that snowballed into like, Hey, you guys are pretty good. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? And then by the time I knew it, I was standing across the cage from somebody in my first MMA fight, you know, X amount of months later, five months later, probably. And then from there I was, uh, I was hooked and I, I never wanted to look back and regret anything. So I, I figured the time is now let's, uh, throw it all out there and see what happens. Well, it's interesting. You, you use a key word there. I mean, when you're speaking about passion, uh, you know, and competitiveness, Ryan, it, you look at doing the business. I mean, if you don't have the passion there, right, you're not going to put in the time and effort. Yeah. It's just, it's not reality for any of us as people. And so you, you went down that road where you're passionate about something and then realized, Hey, not only my passion, but I'm actually talented at this. Yeah. And it, it, it would be easy snap at the fingers. As we mentioned that all of a sudden you're here, you are UFC and then Bellator fighting, but it doesn't happen. We know that musicians and everyone, they, they, they play in little venues, right. As you're building your, uh, your, your brand. And that's the same for any company. I look at it for me as a contract. I mean, it's not like, Hey, if from day one, we're doing these high end luxury homes right there, we're yeah. doing a small kitchen bathroom remodel, you know, as we start building that brand similar to you. So it, it, talk about that. I mean, from the different venues, it's not like you just went to UFC. So were you fighting in small circuits and other venues and odd places until you got that, that opportunity? Oh, hundred percent. Um, you know, my first fight, like I was telling you, it was at Camp Verde at the Indian reservation, you know, and it, it for me, it was always a means, you know, to the, to the end. And it was go in there, get enough fights, get your record up so you can get to this big show. I wasn't in it to mill around in the lower level shows at all. It was all or nothing for me. And so, you know, I, I fought Camp Verde twice. I actually fought in the Cayman Islands, which was kind of cool. <laughs> Fought in Globe in the Equestrian Center for free. In Globe. Cain uh, Velasquez. Explain to Globe. So so real quick for anyone yeah. listening that doesn't know, talk to him about Globe and where that's at. Oh, Globe is like a little mining town, you know, uh, probably, I don't know, maybe two hours outside of, of Phoenix here. And I mean, there's nothing there. Nothing at all. Yeah, there's and nothing. We drove up there the day of, we weighed in, and I, I fought this guy. And uh, I remember people were like, oh, you're fighting Dickie, Dickie Chavez? Oh, man. I'm like, who the, who the hell is this guy? You know, I went out there and beat him pretty good. But, um, you know, in, in a, the probably the oddest place I fought was a bullfighting ring in Mexico. And that was with Kenny <laughs> Velasquez, a former UFC champion, and uh, CB, CB Dalloway, you know, buddy of mine, a uh, UFC guy. Went down there. It was supposed to be, you know, the guy talks it up all the time. Supposed to be a huge show. There's probably like 14 people in the in the stands. We're, war we're warming up, and there's hay and all that stuff in the in the locker room and the stalls. <laughs> and we went out there in a, a three roped ring and, and fought. And it was as hard as concrete, you know. And so after that, you know, I got my record up. Like I said, I was just trying to get my record up. My buddy CB went, was on the Ultimate Fighter and was in the finals the year before. And at that time, they were looking for, you know, talent. They were looking for All-American wrestlers. And my buddy was on there, did well, put in a good word for me. My coach had put in a good word. And I, I flew up to uh, Vegas and we did uh, physicals and stuff. And I walked into a, a boardroom, basically, and sat down with a bunch of Spike TV executives. And they just talked smack to me the whole time. I talked smack to them. And they said, get the hell out of here. I'm like, all right. And they started laughing. And we left. And. I got a call like, all right, you're in. And, uh, that's how I got on the ultimate fighter. It's interesting because you know, that the, there's a lot to life when you're thinking of not only athletics for you, Ryan, but even business when you're patients, right? There's, there's a patient side of that. And, and 
you understand that, yeah, the work ethic, but as you know, when you're down in Mexico and you're fighting and here's hay bales, right? This isn't some luxury, yeah. you know, facility that you're prepping for the fight. I mean, you're fighting just to build that name and reputation till you can get that break, that big break. And, you know, most people say, well, I'm lucky, but anyone that works hard understands they create their own luck. Right. Yep. And in essence, that's what you've done, right? You make enough contacts, Ryan, you meet enough people, you work really hard. Then that opportunity comes for ultimate fighter. Now you're ready. You're prepared because you've done that. Like you've prepared your entire life for this. Yeah. And so it's not by luck. And, you know, talk about that experience going to spike TV. And now, now you have your opportunity. This is the moment where you can come in and, and start building that reputation and opportunity. Yeah, no, I, I love what you said, you know, you make your own luck because you really do, you know, um, you're, you're standing there when the opportunity arises, right? And you put yourself in that position. And I believe, if, you know, that wholeheartedly, you know, and that's even if outside of my athletic career, you know, um, uh, one thing, you know, I feel like being a good person is part of that and, you know, mm -hmm. and making those friend, friendships and contacts and being that guy where people are like, no, he's a solid guy, you know, he's honest, trustworthy, this and that. And, I've got a lot of, a ton of opportunities outside of the athletic world because of that also business ventures and, and whatnot, you know? And so, um, being there and, and knowing mindset going in that, Hey, I'm going to get five fights. So I'm five and oh, I could, you know, I'm an all American wrestler. I know like all ultimate fighter wise. And, and granted we were maybe not going to do that show contract wise. It's not a great contract, you know? And, um, but we decided, you know what, it's great exposure. We're going to do it, you know? And so, um, in, in that show, six weeks, no outside contact with the, with the outside world. You couldn't leave the house, no magazines, nothing. You're just in a house. They take your cell phone and it's 16 guys, you know, in a house and they're just waiting for drama to erupt, you know? And yeah, the whole mindset going in is I've done this, you know, a million times I've been through five wrestling seasons at ASU where that it's six months long, not six weeks, keep my head down, do the right things. I'm going to win this thing. And sure enough, four weeks in people started breaking. Oh, you know, I didn't have any kids at the time or anything like that, but you know, I miss my family. I miss this. I'm, and I would hear the, these, you know, comments all the time. I'm like, man, I'm going to win this whole thing. Cause I, I love to be here. I want to be here. And sure enough, end up winning that. Um, you know, in the finals there, got a knockout and then you realize, okay, now I'm in the bottom, bottom of the barrel now in, in the UFC, you know? And so definitely of making your own luck and, and being there, you know, when the rewards are coming back, you know, and that, that's huge, you know, and a lot of people quit and a lot of people give up well beyond when they reap any rewards whatsoever. So how do you keep that barrier? I mean, when you're there, I mean, you, you, you mentioned you had the background in college, which is great because you've had that fraternity essentially, you know, with the wrestlers there, but you're in a home with 16 people and there has to be some sort of mama mentality, right? Like Kobe, like you're, even though you can have a friendship, like you're ready to, I mean, you have to have that killer mentality, right? Yeah. And so how do you keep that guard up where, Hey, I can be amicable, but at the same time, like when it comes time to fight and to get to, to be the champion, like I'm ready to turn it on, you know, and not let any other distractions get in my way. Yeah. I mean, I don't really have a tough demeanor. I'm not trying to be a hard ass or anything like that. And, and I had a lot of friends. I was friendly with everybody on there. Um, but the thing is too, you realize, cause you train, I mean, you don't train with the other team there, but you train with your team and that's where you kind of get your pecking order out. You know, when I went in there, you know, um, you're rolling, you're sparring, you're doing everything with guys out of your weight that you could potentially fight. You know, you're fighting team versus team, but you could fight somebody on the finals on your own team. And so um, that's where you kind of do that, right? That's where I'm going hard. I'm, I'm making sure that I'm whooping everybody here, that they know I'm the top dog. And that kind of gets disseminated into the house too. You know, and then um, obviously you're fighting. I was first up to fight. And so I fought Tom Lawler, went out there, uh, who I'm good friends with now, went out there and I knocked him out pretty, you know, pretty brutally. And that kind of set the tone for the rest of it. But, uh, you know, I'm not one of those guys that puts on a facade, oh, tough, this, you know, I'm going to be me. I'm have fun, goofy, whatever. And, and that's how my vibe was in the house. And there were other guys that were kind of trying to put off that vibe, but you could see through it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. I, I'll give you some kudos there because the first time I met you, Ryan, I mean, 
super amicable, super friendly, outgoing, and you're yourself, right? And that draws people in, right? That, you know, that I picked up on that right away. I know that's which we'll get into some of the success you've had just as business, right? Social media and other ventures that we'll get into later. But how did that, you know, winning, you know, the ultimate fighter, how did that change, you know, the trajectory? trajectory of your career yeah like i was saying too they they don't have the best contract especially then you know and everybody else yeah. like, oh you're making all this money you're like man like fighting three times a year you have no idea. yeah i mean you're making a decent a decent living i guess but not really you know not what you're in the sport for you know and so it took a little while you know and and uh we had to re- renegotiate before basically it 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 uh, expired um, to get a new contract. We're like, look, you know, we're not fighting this guy on our ultimate fighter contract, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm grateful for it because I got that exposure and I got those bigger fights. You know, if we went the harder route and, um, you know, just try to do it one fight at a time in the UFC, you know, you're starting off fighting nobody, nobody, nobody until you beat somebody, then you can fight somebody, you know? Um, So I'm very grateful that experience and it was so much fun. I made lifelong friendships through that experience, you know. Um, um, but after that, you definitely you're starting back at the bottom. And since you're the ultimate fighter winner, you have a little little leeway to try to build you up. But man, I was fighting, you know, three fights in. I was fighting Keith Jardine, who just beat Chuck Liddell and all this kind of stuff. And so you you get thrown right to the wolves. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And so when you speak about the contract side, not to get any dollar amount. But this is, I think, what most people don't understand is that when you're under contract, you know, explain how that is. Do they cover travel to the event and fighting? But the training itself is up to you, right? I mean, the training and diet and nutrition and all this stuff. You know, how does that integrate with what is covered by UFC when you're under contract and what's on your own, you know, as far as that? Yeah, I mean, they cover everything in the fight, give you hotel rooms, all that kind of stuff. Um, But yeah, everything here. um, I've been fortunate enough to have. I, I like one big thing that I live by is have good people around you. Right. And there's times like we had to figure that out, but like coaching staff and all that, um, you got to pay them, you got to pay your manager. Um, uh, but going back to having good people around you, you know, I have a great manager. I have great coaches, you know, where it's, they're not going out there and exploiting you and, and Hey, I'm taking 20% or 30% of, of your purse and this and that, you know, we all worked something out, sat down and said, you know, Hey, this is what it's going to be. Is it all right with you? Yes. Perfect. You know? And so, yeah, you're paying for everything, you know, and, um, you know, even throughout UFC where you're making a couple hundred grand a fight, this and that people are like, Oh, you know, you're making so much money. You're like, not really, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going out there and doing this brutal sport. And I have to pay my coaching coaches. Um, obviously, I pay, pay my expenses in training camp and this and that. And yeah, you're making, you know, decent money. But um, you know, I always wanted to get to the point where I'm making, you know, NFL type money. You know, not crazy superstar NFL, but to the point where you know you're at that level where you're like, all right, you know, this makes sense, and I'm gonna treat it like it is. I always have, but it's like. Uh, um, like I am playing in the NFL, like I am in the NBA and this and that. So um, finally getting to that point. And, and, but back in the day when you're making, you know, I mean, 20 grand for uh, uh, to win the ultimate fighter, you know, and you pay your coaches and you pay, the, you know, everything. You're like, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doesn't go very far. Better. Yeah, it's true. And, I, you know, there's. There is a business mentality there, as you mentioned, Ryan, when you start thinking about any good CEO understands that they have people around them, as you mentioned, they're surrounding themselves with good people, right? And not only that, they're going to hire people in certain positions that are better than they are, right? You're going to have, you know, certain people and that's the support system, right? That's people that are executing and that's the the value of a good CEO. And that's essentially, I mean, you're a, a, a small little enterprise, right, Ryan, that you're the CEO, you're surrounded by good people that are going to be ethical with you and train you and then prepare you for what you're doing. This is your career. And and, and that's really important. Yeah. You know, you, you're going to want somebody to do your, your taxes or, you know, Hey, I need this PowerPoint done. You can't do it all. Right. And like you said, you get somebody, you know, better than you. Hey, you want, I need somebody great in marketing and that knows all the Facebook algorithms and this and that, you know, um, 
and you're going to oversee everything. And obviously you're going to put in the work yourself, you know? Um, so that it's the same thing with what we do. You know, I have a strength coach. I have my head coach. I have a striking coach, you know, my head coach runs the, the strength coach and the striking coach and kind of oversees everything. And, um, you know, he'll watch video and, Hey, we're going to drill this and this. And, you know, my job is to also do all that, but also, Try not to worry about all the little things and show up and do the work and 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 put that work in and at, at the end of the day perform you know and be in the best shape i can and make sure there's no distractions in my life and you know um everything's good at home and this and that and so i um, mean it's definitely run like a business for sure well i think you bring up the family side which i think is fascinating because i love following you on social media You're totally family man right ryan and What's amazing is as you're preparing for a fight, you still have kids, you have a wife, you know, so what does a normal day look like for you as far as training, family time, and then especially as you get close to the fight, right? How do you, you know, mindset prepare while still, I don't want to say distractions, but we understand I'm a dad, I have kids and I know what it's like when your mind's trying to prepare for something and you have all these things going on. So I've gotten a lot better at separating MMA, gym time, family time. You know, I try not to bring family time into the gym and vice versa, the gym or MMA side into my family. And I've gotten it a lot better. I mean, I have 35 something fights now, but back in the day, you know, in training camp, just in general, you know, I, and I got, it was, it was more before I had kids, but I would be distant, you know, and everything. And I was, I'll, I'll, cause you're always thinking about somebody, a date, and you're always looking into the future which is I have to slow myself down, but like, all right, Hey, enjoy the day here. Cause you know, all right, Monday's down Tuesday down. All right. Wednesday, I have a hard day Thursday, you know? And so I try to, I, I've tried to fix all that, but you know, day for me is, you know, well, I have three kids and I have a, a nine, eight and a six year old, you know, if they're in school, my wife and I will get them ready for school. Um, usually I'll drop them off and then uh, I'll go to my first training session, which is usually two, It'll be like a lift or something and then a, you know, a striking session. Um, then I'll have a couple hours before the next one. So I'll come home and, and like I said, I have different business ventures and all that kind of stuff. So I'll answer emails, you know, I'll do all that kind of stuff for a couple hours. And then I'm back, you know, around 3.30 or 4, you know, doing our heavy session, which lasts about two hours. And that's where, you know, the whole um, MMA team gets together and we're, you're sparring, we're grappling, all that kind of stuff. And so I'll do that, come back, um, and I'll either pick my kids up from sports or I'll, I'll take them or my wife takes them, you know, and then we'll get back, eat dinner. And by that time, you know, it's seven, eight o'clock, you know. And so um, that's pretty much kind of the usual day. I'll have a, I'll have a more of a rest day in there, usually, you know, Wednesday. And um, I'll kind of – try to rest and recover. Like I said, do your emails, this and that, but that's more of an open day. If I have to get any, anything done, like a, a recovery at all, you know, have a great kind of uh, massage kind of dude that you know, sports massage, basically that I'll work on me. Um, and that's that day, Saturday, I'll get up and I'll, you know, so that's Monday through Friday, rest day, Wednesday, Saturday, get up and we run the Hills at some park. Um, and then Sunday's off. And so, you know, weekends, we, we try to do stuff with the kids and I'm always go, go, go. So it's always something to do. Oh yeah. And right now, I mean, that's tough. I mean, for those listening, I mean, hopefully you have at least a pool day in there on Wednesday. Cause it's a little warm out right now. A hundred percent. You know, it's raining a little bit here, but yeah, the kids been in the pool yeah. pretty much every day. And, uh, that's what people don't realize in Arizona. It's like a winter. Uh, a bad winter anywhere else. Yeah. Like your kids yep. can't go outside. Right. And so they're, they're inside most of the time. And so uh, we try to make some trips up North. Um, you know, uh, my wife's family has a, a ranch out there. We go up there out to California or something like that to try to keep my wife sane. Yeah, <laughs> that, I, I can relate to that over the summer. You know, luckily we have a pool and my wife is sending the kids out there multiple yeah. times a day, right? To wear oh, out yeah. a little bit, you know, so I'll, you, you mentioned the training part, right? How much time you're spending a day training. And then not only that, you know, balancing the office, you know, the business side of things. And then of course the family time, you know, so 
what is your favorite thing? You you know, wrestling is the core, yeah. right? It, it, your background is you got MMA. What has been your favorite aspect of MMA? You know, is you know from the technical side, is it the kickboxing? Is it the striking? I mean, what is it that you've really gained a passion for and enjoy now? What I love about MMA is my my passion switches every couple of months or yearly, basically. Like I'll be really into striking, and then you know now I'm really into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, putting the gi on, mm -hmm. you know, and um, and so that's what one thing that I love about MMA as far as you know wrestling, it's wrestling, right? And I got sick yeah. of getting down on my stance, shooting double legs, yeah. drilling like that. And so MMA, if you get bored with something, there's always something else you can work on. And like I said, right now I'm, I do it all. I, you know, I strike, I, we, we grapple, we spar, we do it every week. Um, but right now I'm doing a little more, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and a gi and, and loving it, you know? And, and, uh, when my fight comes around, you know, we have the blueprint to what we need to be successful in, uh, for a camp. And we'll go back to that. But, you know, in the meantime, which I say was, you know, quote unquote off time, which is not, um, I try to do a little something that I'm into and, and that could be striking, could be, could be uh, jujitsu, but, um, I've wrestled my whole life, you know, and, and so I, I always have that, but you got to keep that up too. And so I continue, continue to do everything, but, um, you know, learning the intricacies of striking and jujitsu, um, has been fun and I, I haven't got sick of it yet. I love that. And there's a versatility, right? It keeps you on your toes in the sense like business, right? Any good business is separating themselves and being versatile, you know, construction, you know, you have ups and downs in any market. It's going to happen right now. It's, it's good, but it, there's going to be a down part. So how are you versatile as a company? How, are, how can you work between these different venues so that you're prepared, you know, as the market dictates and for you in MMA, it's no different, right? This is what keeps you aggressive. It keeps you, you know, totally engaged There's all these different items as you mentioned from grapple to spar and jujitsu yeah. and so forth so how, how often when when they're setting up a fight whether it be bellator right now you know or ufc in the past how much advance notice and depending on who you're assigned to fight is there a lot of strategy as far as understanding their strengths and weaknesses do i need to prepare more in jujitsu for this do i need to prepare you know to spar a little bit more i mean how does that come into play yeah, usually you get i mean you usually get at least eight weeks about two months you know notice um if not more you know, a lot of times it's 12 weeks, like, hey, we're thinking, you know, you're going to fight in September. Like right now, you know, they said, it's, you know, I'm in a tournament. And they're like, oh, it looks like July. This was a couple months ago. And they're like, hey, it looks like it's going to be pushed back. It'll be September. And so I pretty much know. I already know my opponent because I'm in a tournament. Um, mm -hmm. and so it makes it easy. Uh, but there's been times where I've taken short notice fights on four weeks notice, you know, and this and that. Wow. Like, you know, my last fight in the UFC – um, I, so they usually, they usually re-sign you with one fight left, you know, so you're never a free agent. Um, but they call, it was my 20th fight in the UFC. They called, Hey, can you, you know, take this fight in four weeks notice? We said, yeah, sign the contract. They're like, Hey, we got to redo your deal. And we're like, actually, we're not going to do it. And they got kind of pissed or whatever, but we're like, Hey, you know, it's time to bet on ourselves and whatnot. You know, so that kind of, that's how the kind of that worked out. And, um, Forgot your original question, but oh yeah, I was just saying like when you when you know who you're fighting, just oh, yeah. the strategy behind that, understanding what I need to work on because hey, this is maybe one of the strengths or weaknesses to target. So 100 percent on that, and and um, I've been in this sport a long time, right? And people will come and go, training partners and everything. And in Arizona, there's a shortage of big guys. Basically, there's a lot of little guys. Yeah, but there's only maybe three or four good big guys, like that are worth like your size yep. and whatever <laughs> in the in the valley yeah and so yeah. Uh, my coach is from brazil highly respected and all that knows a lot of people so we're we'll always pull some guys some good guys from brazil you know and just like we're going back to expenses you know i'll get them an airbnb pay for their food pay them um to train and we'll try to try to get guys that can mimic your opponent you know and, and emulate him and we'll make them watch a bunch of videos before they come and and have that same style when they're here. Um, yeah, so we, I don't like to watch too much video because I don't want to get in the trap of what he's doing. I want to do what I do and what I do well. My coach is the one that's going to dive in and say, all right, every time he throws a jab, his right comes down a little bit or this and that. He loves this combo. 
And so and then we'll work and drill on that. And we'll drill on with we'll drill that with the people that are emulated him too. And we'll spar them in, in so there's a lot that goes into that for sure. And if they're you know, if I'm fighting a wrestler that's, you know, um gonna try to take me down a lot, I'll have those guys in practice, you know, constantly trying to take me down and I gotta fight that off. I gotta get that type of conditioning where you're wrestling, wrestling and back to striking. And so there's a lot that goes into it. It's interesting you bring that up because I think most people listen don't realize just the amount of detail, preparation, and even expense, as you mentioned. I mean, in the NFL, you know, if they're playing Lamar Jackson, who's a quick running quarterback, they're going to bring someone in on practice squad, right? That's going to emulate that yeah. so they can practice that game time speed, how they're going to move. But the com- you know, the company, the NFL, the team is covering that. Whereas you as an independent, here you are, Ryan, saying, okay, I need to prep for this fight. So I'm going to fly in a comp fighter out of Brazil, put yeah. him up, train. I mean, there's there's so much to this that people don't realize. But then here you are, you know, and talk about – this is something I just had to ask you. Like, yeah. in, you know, in Bellator 214 when Fedor came in, I mean, as that preparation, and here you are, 30 seconds, you come in and, and, and you connect and you get there. I mean, what is, it, what is that feeling to just stand up in the ring and it's like – all that preparation came to fruition. Yeah, and, and I put out a video too on my Instagram where we were practicing that hook because we we realized in that preparation that he he loves to go back and keep his hand down and he'll go kind of to the side but back and his hands are down because uh, he's fast. You know, he can take a punch and all that. And so um, we were training it in the locker room. Boom, boom, boom. You know, and then to go out there and implement that and knock out Fedor, you know, and Mm -hmm. it was in a tournament. It was in a Grand Prix. It was for my second belt, you know, and it was Fedor at the end of the day and boom, it happens. It was just, when I look back on my career, I'll always remember that moment and I could go on to do bigger and better things, you know, you know, in the future here in this sport, but that will always be kind of my defining moment, you know, Pat crowd, um, huge night. It was Fedor and then knocking him out. And then all my family and friends were there, you know, family got to come to the cage, all that kind of stuff. And it was definitely a, a very cool night. And, and for me, I never, I was, you know, I came up a huge fan of Fedor as of many people. Um, mm-hmm. but I thought no way, even if, when he was in Bellator, no way would I ever be in the cage with them. He's a heavyweight. I'm a light heavyweight you know, where it's just different paths and this and that. And then when we were in that tournament, I was like, how cool would it be if we ended up in the finals? And then yeah. I got my head down, did my business, and he did his, and they were right there. And I'm like, and then it happened. And it was one of the cooler nights of my life. Well, it's it's really neat because you can see the excitement, which you can totally relate to, just all that preparation. And here you are fighting in, in Idaho, if you will, and you make it to the championship. You know, so for those listening that haven't, you know, fought or – you know, especially any athletes that can relate. I mean, what? How, how do you control that adrenaline? I've been at the UFC fight, and to be there in person, just the adrenaline of the people there and the excitement and how loud it is. I mean, how do you gauge that energy as you're coming in and to not overwhelm yourself with the emotion and energy that's there, you know, as as the fight starts? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of – it's it's really time. Um, nobody can really put themselves in, in, in a fighter's shoes unless they've gone in the cage because it's a different – it's a different deal and some guys can't handle it. And that's why they don't fight anymore. And that's why they, they're 50% of themselves when they go in, you know, once you get there fight week, you're like, Oh, I have the fights in a distant future, right? I'm five nights away. You know, I can sleep easy, all that. And all of a sudden you're like, all right, when I wake up tomorrow, I have one more night. And then the next day I'm fighting somebody in a cage. Right. And then yeah. you're the night before and you're like, all right, I go to sleep. It's fight day. And fight day for me is, is one of the worst days because, you know, I don't like to do much. Um, we're hanging out and you're just sitting around waiting to get, you know, go to the arena where you can fight another trained human being in a cage for people to watch, you know? Right. So it's definitely a mental challenge. Um, and for me, I just know that the nerves are a part of it you need to embrace it. You know, I've done well in my whole athletic career. I used to get nervous wrestling. Some guys should, you know, mop the floor with, but, um, when I started embracing it and be like, all right, this is where I'm, I'm supposed to feel this way. I'm prepared. And knowing that I did everything I could do to prepare myself to be successful, I can walk into that cage, you know, worry free and, and whatever the outcome, 
it's fine because I did everything I needed to do. And now if I slacked, which I never have, or had an injury or something mm-hmm. where I couldn't, you know, um, train the best that I could train, that would be different. But I've always walked in the cage usually, except a couple times I had an injury, knowing that I've done everything I could do. So the outcome is, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm just going to go fight minute by minute, round by round until I win that fight usually, or if I happen to lose, it is what it is. It, it's funny that mentality is so true, that preparation, you know, and speaking, you know, most people have an issue with public speaking, right? Getting yeah. in front of a large area and speaking and being in front, right? That's really difficult. Most people, <laughs> yeah, the anxiety, like right? And, and leading up to speaking. But what's funny is those that are really successful to say it's all preparation, you know, as you prepare and you know your speech or you know the content and you've done this, like there, there is a safeguard there that that preparation now puts you in a position to be calm, right? And in essence, that's what you're saying that, yeah, there's this anxiety during the day because you're like, just hurry and get here to fight. I've prepared, yeah. right? But being prepared when you're ready to get in that ring, you know, there's a calmness because as you said, you've done all this preparation, you know what to do, you know your technique, you practice, so, so you're ready. Absolutely. I mean, when I start warming up in the locker room, you know, obviously you're getting your body going, everything goes away. And I, and I start smiling. I'm like, all right, you know, we have a little, you know, um, routine basically, you know, it's funny cause you know, you're, I eat during the day. I mean, you, sometimes it's tough to eat cause your, your nerves are going whatever, but I, mm-hmm. I bring these mashed up sweet potatoes into the locker room. <laughs> and so my trainers know, know it. And sometimes you can't bring food in. So I have to sneak it in and they go put it in the bathroom <laughs> stall and you know, I'll go eat it. Cause it just, it just helps my stomach. And then I warm up. Yeah. I feel amazing. Everything goes away, all those emotions, and you know, and and uh, you know, start smiling. I put my hands in the air, you know, and, and you know, I'm not tricking myself or anything like that. But it just if you smile and you act like you're, you know, you're ready, you want it, which we are, you know, it, you're ready to go. And so we'll go through these different motions, and and um, then we're in the tunnel, ready to go out. And you're like, this is it. I've, you know, I've waited for this moment for two to three months, I'm prepared. Why not go out there and win? Why not go out there and allow yourself to be successful? Let's go. You walk out and then, you know, it's fight time. Once it starts, you're like, oh, this is fun. I'm ready to do this. I, you know, I feel great. And do you ever notice, like, how, how much does the crowd affect you? You know, does it affect your energy or emotion, you know, as you hear them roar? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, um, I try not, I try to kind of separate it. Cause I don't want, I don't want them to dictate my thinking or my split second to, you know, decision-making in there because it's usually pretty good. And so, you know, say you rock somebody and they're like, ah, you know, yeah. and maybe you usually be more patient there, but you run in and all of a sudden you get hit, you know? So, um, I try to kind of separate it, but it is cool to see, you know, you pick somebody up and slam them and they, you know, the crowd goes wild, you know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Um, and then it could be opposite too. You know, they could be booing because there is, you know, a yeah. twenty second, you know, stalemate when La you get to the right? Like, yeah. You know, and uh, you can't let them get to you in that way either. You know, and so um, last couple of fights we've been fighting without a crowd, so and that's been different too. You know, um, but in that aspect, I mean, you could do whatever you want because nobody's cheering or booing, yeah. and it allows you to just think throughout, you know, your whole deal like you're in training. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, I think it's pretty unique to have a fighter such as you, Ryan, to come out and, and just talk about that preparation and leading up and just that energy and how you're preparing for a fight and that excitement. So, no, speaking to the business side, you know, you're, you're super active on social media, which I've told you, you know, your stories are like my favorite to follow. <laughs> I know you've got that from other people too, like super, yeah. I just love everything you posted on there. You know, but how did you get involved with Killcliff and, and some of the business ventures? You know, how does social media play a role and just, you know, people you've met in the industry? Yeah, the Kill Cliff came about, you know, my manager, we've always had good, great sponsors as far as we have a relationship with, you know, and we have, we have a bunch of big, bigger companies, you know, he's from out South Dakota. So there's a couple of huge companies out there in the ethanol business and the healthcare business, you know, and then uh, we got together with Kill Cliff kind of through that, you know, um, you know, friends of the friends just kind of meeting and, and, uh, you know, I was kind of involved with Black Rifle Coffee too, you know, mm-hmm. and so, um, and then meeting them you know, we're like, this falls right into the, you know, our right. wheelhouse, you know, as far as, you know, yeah. we don't want, you know, Hey, 
Hey Brad, send me a shirt and I'll wear it out, you know, and you pay me and <laughs> right. we never talk again. Right. Right. It's right. things where we like to develop a relationship, you know, and I just got back with those guys. We were in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We were there for five, four or five days, you know, whitewater rafting, ATV riding, all that kind of stuff, you know, and so shooting. it was amazing yeah. shooting. It was amazing, you know, and so that's the kind of relationship we, we love and I think they love too, you know, as far as being a part of the, the team and not just like, hey, this is a, kind of a business transaction and that's it, you know, and so they're, they're great dudes. They give back. Um, it is a huge deal for me too. We've always given back. We, I mean, just from purses and stuff like that, we've given over a hundred grand to various military, military organizations that, you know, that we believe in and we could be a part of. And, you know, Killcliffe has given over a million bucks, you know, and continue to do so. Um, so our, our, all of our stars aligned and kind of the same like-minded people. I love that because when I met you, it was actually at a fundraiser, right? And yep. and you, to your point, without, you know, just to toot your horn again, Ryan, I mean, you went up there and you gave a check right away to Dash, who was up speaking, you know, for the Navy SEAL Foundation. And, you know, it's interesting. You know, I've, I've found that the people that are charitable, and even for you, as you're working with sponsors, it, it's not just a dollar transaction, but there's actually a relationship behind it, right? And it, mm -hmm. it's not even that it's an ethical thing, but there's a partnership. And and it shows, right? And when you when you have that, similar mentality and backing and branding. I mean, that's that cohesiveness, that's that synergy. And that's really what builds your network. That's all it's about. You know, um, I feel like I'm good at reading people and, and um, on that emotional level. And, you know, it's just, it's just like Dash, for example, you know, we met for the first time there, you know, and we I've just been in Wyoming with them, you know, and I love that dude. He's a good person. You know, I'm getting him set up for this, different organization where he can get, you know, tags to go hunting and hunt elk and everything out here in Arizona and stuff. And, and oh, that, that's, that's awesome. all it's about, you know, and, and, and people helping you out, you helping people out and networking and, and finding like-minded people. I, I kind of go back to what I was saying earlier, you know, I like to have, you know, good people around me and the right people around me, you know, and as you get older, I think, you know, everybody realizes that too. And they start to weed out people that they don't want around them, have bad energy or, you know, don't bring, it's not necessarily bringing anything to the table, but you're like, you know, um, it's just, you need to be around like-minded people. And, and that's kind of my motto. And so the, even these organizations that we've given to in the past and whatever, they, they've been the same, you know, um, um, I wore a shirt out one time and uh it was higher heroes it was uh brian stan you know he he started this he was a ufc fighter um was a marine and he we did a little deal with him i was gonna wear a shirt out wore the shirt out he got a email from a vet saying hey you know i haven't gotten at like a job interview in three years to the point where i was about to do something bad i saw Hire heroes on Ryan's shirt. I applied. I got a job, you know, three weeks later, and now I'm happy as can be. And so that kind of stuff for me is what it's all about. And, um, and just hope to kind of make that kind of impact, even if it's one person. Yeah, that mentality, Ryan, I mean, it, it shows in, you know, everything that we've spoken about in this episode and just you know, that mentality, I mean, you've brought so much and I want to be sensitive to your time because I know it's your day off today and I appreciate yeah. making time for us. But, you know, just that mentality and, you know, at, preparation, surrounding yourself with good people, right? Execution, consistency. I mean, these are things that every single person listening, and it doesn't matter if you're an athlete or a business owner, or as you mentioned, if you're young, trying to get an MMA, if you're trying to start a business, I mean, these are applicable principles that everyone should be doing. And as you give back, as you mentioned, that charity arm, it changes your whole perspective. And that really shows the type of person you are. No, I appreciate that. But yeah, that, I think there's a, it's a good outline, you know, for, for life, you know, for family, for business, you know, anything, um, you know, for me, there's a couple of principles, be consistent. Like we talked about, have good people around you, you know, and there, there's really no substitute to hard work and being there. There really isn't, you know, and that's what I feel like a lot of people these days and, even athletes are like, Hey, how do I get to the UFC? What have you done? Well, nothing, you know, I, I'm thinking about, yeah. well, like, well, you got to put in your work to get to where you want to be. It, do, it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, every overnight success is, 
10, 20, 30 years in the making, you know, and they put in that work, you know, and so um, those are some, you know, stuff that I like to live by and just be good to people uh, unless they don't deserve it. And then, you know, it'll, everything will come back to you. Yeah, it's interesting because you're almost 30 years, right, from when you started wrestling till now. I yeah. mean, you've, that, that, it's a long journey. This is not a shortcut, right, to life. Oh. And, you know, so, so what do you have that's upcoming and exciting? I mean, what are you looking forward to, Ryan, that, that we should be looking yeah, out so, for? Yeah, um, so, you know, I'm a current Bellator heavyweight champion, and they mm -hmm. asked me to come down. So I, so I won my last fight, beat Machida. Um, but my fight before, we were going to fight heavyweight. And they call him like, "Hey, I think we can get the uh, you know this Russian guy in for light heavyweight." I was I had the light heavyweight belt also, and so I def I was going to defend that kind of short notice. So I went in there, ended up getting beat. So I'm like, "All right, cool. I'm going to be heavyweight now. Going to fight heavyweight, you defend my title." And they're like, "Okay, we have uh, we're going to do a Grand Prix at light heavyweight. Would you want back in?" And I'm all about opportunities to say, "Absolutely, let's do it." And so uh, instead of defending my heavyweight title, I went, went out, fought Machida in the first round. Um, so I'm in the semifinals now of the light heavyweight tournament. I'm fighting Corey Anderson. Um, you know, he's top five light heavyweight across the board in the world right now. Um, so fighting him in September and then beat him, I'll be in the finals to, to have the opportunity to fight for the belt, light heavyweight belt once again. And then uh, I'll go back and defend the heavyweight belt they're doing an interim title for that on Friday. And so I'll be able to uh, defend that and kind of unify that belt. And, you know, that's a plan. Just kind of one fight at a time, keep my head down, you know, but there's a lot on the line. Belts are on the line and everything. And so um, training always, but uh, in a couple, probably in a month there, I'll be in hardcore training camp. Well, we're excited to follow along, you know, especially for you to to win back the the lightweight belt and, of course, the uh, you know defend the heavyweight belt. So, Ryan, can't thank you enough for making time. And for those listening, where can our listeners find you? Yeah, on social media, I'm just at Ryan Bader. In my, like, I'm more active on Instagram than anything, um, but I have a Twitter, Facebook, and all that. So, um, just yeah, Ryan Bader. You're the best, man. Appreciate making time. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate it, brother.